Stacy had to appear in court after a trial period for her adoption. She had lived with her new foster parents for about three months. Stacy was glad that she could finally come to court. This was the time to get everything off her chest. The judge was very reserved. And the parents acted like they were the perfect match for Stacy. Hoping that she would not open her mouth. But out of nowhere, and to everyone's surprise. Stacy decided to speak up and interrupt the judge. This could not be good. The break was over. And the judge ordered everyone to return to the courtroom. Stacy sighed and followed her caseworker quietly. Back to their seats but not. Before giving her foster parents one final confident look. Making them even more nervous. They had no idea what Stacy was about to do. Stacy's caseworker noticed her piercingly. Looking at her foster parents. And tugged on Stacy's arm, asking. What does that look mean? Don't do something you'll regret later. Stacy. This is a lovely family. You don't have to ruin it. But her caseworker had no idea. What was going on behind closed doors? The judge started the trial. And was in the middle of a sentence. When Stacy suddenly stood up. And interrupted him, saying. I have something to say, and it's very important. The judge was astonished. By this rude interruption but allowed Stacy to speak. She said, this isn't the lovely family everyone seems to believe. But what was the secret? That would lead to the arrest of her foster father. Somewhere in New York. There lived a young girl named Stacy. Stacy had a difficult childhood. Bouncing from place to place. From foster home to foster home. She longed for a permanent place to call home. And a family to call her own. But despite her hope. The foster homes she was placed in were never quite. What she had envisioned. She had been to different foster homes. But never stayed for more than a few weeks. She felt very alone and had very few friends. Just one girl named Mia and her caseworker Jim. Were the only steady things in her life. She knew that whatever happened. She could always rely on them. Stacy's caseworker Jim. Had watched Stacy bounce from house to house. She always tried her best. But it just never seemed to work out. Finally, there were only a few foster families left. And the Brooklyn family was one of them. Jim really thought that this family. Would be the perfect fit, but it's not always as it seems. One day, Stacy was placed in yet another foster home. But this one was different from the others. The Brooklyn family seemed perfect at first. With two loving foster parents, a foster brother. And a comfortable home. But as time passed. Stacy began to notice strange things. About her foster father. Her foster father's strange behavior. Was the first sign to Stacy that something was wrong with this family. She did a little digging and unraveled a big, scary secret. There was something very wrong about this family. And no one from the outside had any idea. Not until Stacy decided enough was enough. At least, at first, Stacy did not know what to do. She was scared to speak up. But she also knew that she didn't want to stay with this family forever. Luckily for Stacy, her trial period was coming to an end. And she knew that all she had to do was go to court very soon. There, she would reveal all her secrets. All Stacy had to do was hold on for a couple more days. But it was harder than she thought. Her foster brother gave her a hard time. And would often pick on her. And her foster mother wasn't as kind. As she portrayed herself to be. But Stacy's suffering would soon come to an end. The day of the court hearing was filled with tension for Stacy. She woke up early. Her stomach churning with nerves as she got dressed. And prepared for the day ahead. She knew that this hearing would decide her fate. And she was both scared and determined. 
to make sure that the truth was heard. She and her foster family had to go to court separately. So Stacy got picked up. Early by her caseworker. Jim. He could sense Stacy's nervousness, but didn't say a thing. He knew how gut-wrenching times. Like these were for the kids. So he wanted to make sure the ride was as calm as possible. As she arrived at the courtroom. She could feel her heart pounding in her chest. And her feet turning cold. She walked into the courtroom on her own. And saw her foster parents sitting at the front. Looking confident and self-assured. Stacy's eyes scanned around the room. Taking in the judge, the lawyers. And other people present. She felt a wave of anxiety wash over her. But she pushed it aside and reminded herself. Why she was there. She had to fight for her future. And had to be strong. She didn't want to speak up just for herself. She wanted these people out of the foster care system. So no other child would be placed with them ever again. The hearing began. And Stacy's foster parents spoke first, praising their parenting skills. And how much they loved and cared for Stacy. They even showed pictures of the family together. And a video of them doing fun activities. Trying to persuade the judge that they were the perfect family for her. Stacy listened in silence, her heart pounding with a mix of fear and anger. She knew that they weren't the loving family. They claimed to be and hoped the judge would see through their lies. But as the trial continued, it became clear to Stacy that the judge was blindsided by their behavior. There wasn't much Stacy could do in this situation. Even though she wasn't raised like any other decent girl. She knew you shouldn't interrupt someone. While they were speaking. So she had to think of something else to do. Something that would disrupt the trial. Even if only for a few minutes. Stacy decided to act. She always had to act kind. And nice around families she didn't even know. So how hard could it be to act like she was getting sick? Stacy began by putting her hand on her stomach and frowning at the judge. She then started breathing heavily, trying to make it seem like she was struggling. During the short breaks, everyone had to wait in the hall. And once Stacy's parents thought no one was looking at them, they approached Stacy to give her some advice. I know what you're doing, her foster mother said, but this won't work. You will come and live with us. Even if you don't want to. But Stacy had something else in mind. She hadn't told her foster parents yet. That she knew about their secrets. But now that they were trying to intimidate her. She responded with a well-taught response. Well, I wouldn't be so sure about that. You never know what I might say. This vague response kept her foster parents on edge for the rest of the trial. Just as Stacy intended. All she needed was one slip up in front of the judge. And her story would become more believable. Because Stacy knew damn well. She wouldn't be taken seriously otherwise. Stacy's caseworker walked over to her. As her foster parents walked away. And asked what that was about. And I think, Stacy said. But Jim could see that there was more to it. Don't do something you'll regret later, Stacy. This is a lovely family. You don't want to mess this up, he warned. Stacy wanted to make a snarky remark. But just as she opened her mouth, someone called her for the trial to continue. So Stacy sighed and followed her caseworker. Quietly back to their seats but not before giving her foster parents one final confident look to make them even more nervous. And her tactic worked. Stacy's parents seemed to have lost their confidence. And now, she looked more on edge than before. This gave Stacy the confidence boost she needed. She would wait for the perfect moment to interrupt the judge and tell the truth about what really goes on in that family. Stacy's caseworker noticed her piercing gaze. 
at her foster parents and tugged on Stacy's arm. What does that look mean? Don't do something you'll regret later, Stacy, he warned. The judge proceeded with the trial. Discussing many things. That Stacy didn't understand. Stacy's caseworker kept a watchful eye on her. Because he suspected. That she was about to do something foolish. But that didn't stop Stacy. She knew she would never forgive herself if she didn't speak up. The judge was in the middle of a sentence. When Stacy suddenly stood up. Her caseworker tried to get her to sit down. But she refused. I have something to say. And it's very important. The judge was astonished. By this rude interruption but allowed Stacy to speak. This isn't the lovely family everyone seems to believe. Stacy declared. The courtroom fell silent. As the judge looked at Stacy with surprise and concern. He paused for a few seconds, contemplating the situation. Stacy knew there were two possible outcomes. Either he would let her speak or tell her. To sit back down and ignore her. The suspense was unbearable for Stacy. And she could feel all eyes on her. Had she made a mistake by saying this so openly? But then, the judge finally spoke. Walk with me, the judge said as he stood up. Trial is adjourned until we return. Stacy and her caseworker followed the judge. To a small room at the back. The judge closed all the blinds. And sat down at the table in the middle. He looked at Stacy with a very serious expression and said. That's a very serious allegation. But Stacy knew she couldn't say anything else but the truth. I wouldn't lie to you, she replied. I'll be in serious danger if I were to stay with that family. The judge looked even more surprised by her statement. Danger, he asked. Why would you say that, honey? The judge was clearly interested in hearing her story. But Stacy was hesitant to share all the details. Do you promise to believe me? She asked the judge. The judge looked at Jim and back at Stacy. I can't promise that. I'll have to start an investigation. Based on the details you are about to tell me. The judge said. Stacy sighed. She knew deep down this wouldn't be easy. But everything had gotten very serious very quickly. Stacy looked down at the table. Can I talk alone with Jim first? She asked while fidgeting with her fingers. Yes, of course. I'll wait outside. The judge said. He seemed very understanding of Stacy's situation. The judge left the room, and Stacy turned to Jim. What is it, Stacy? he asked with concern. Stacy hesitated but eventually told Jim about her suspicions. She was confused and couldn't believe. What she had discovered. Are you 100% sure, he asked. I just can't believe this would happen in a foster family. They must undergo multiple checks to be accepted as a foster family. I'm telling the truth, Stacy insisted. She was getting more and more impatient. And having adults not believe her was also very frustrating. Eventually, filled with anger, Stacy stood up and ran out of the room. She ran straight past the judge, who tried calling her to come back, but she ignored him. Tears rolled down her cheeks. As she ran through the streets. I'll get them to believe me, she thought. All I need is proof. She knew just the place to find it. She hurried back home. Which was about two or three blocks away. And burst through the doors. Leaving her foster brother behind. What are you doing here? Her foster brother explained. Don't worry about it, Stacy said. This will be the last time you'll see me ever going into this house. She rushed upstairs and into her foster parents' room. She knew just where to look. And quickly found the evidence she needed. She ran downstairs, back to the door. And back to the courtroom. Her heart was beating so fast. That Stacy feared it would jump out of her chest. 
Everyone looked at Stacy as she frantically ran back. It wasn't very unusual to see a little girl running on her own in a busy New York street. When she arrived at the courtroom, she was stopped by the guards. What are you doing here, little girl? They asked her. I have a court hearing. Stacy answered confidently. She tugged her arm from the guard's grip and ran past him, ignoring his protests. Stacy rushed into the same courtroom. She had been to this morning and burst through the door. The judge was just telling everyone about Stacy's disappearance and was shocked to see her return. Stacy's forehead was covered in sweat and she had to catch her breath before she could speak again. Jim ran to her aid and helped her back to her seat. I have the evidence, Jim answered. I have the evidence. Stacy said again. Now loud enough for everyone to hear, Stacy's foster parents shot up from their seats and looked at Stacy with pale faces. Stacy, darling, her foster mother said. What do you mean? Didn't you enjoy your time with us? I thought you enjoyed going on trips with us and having your own room. But Stacy only had eyes for the judge. All right, Stacy, he said, let's go back to the room. No, Stacy answered. I want everyone to hear. Stacy stood up from her seat and adjusted her posture. She looked at her foster parents and gave them one last confident look. Then, she turned her gaze to the judge and began telling her story. This isn't the lovely family everyone believed. And I will tell you why. When I first came to this family, I, too, was blindsided by their kindness. They seemed to really like me and give me a feeling of security. But that feeling soon faded. When I started noticing some strange behavior from my foster father, he acts like an innocent man. But looks can be deceiving. That man is a bank robber, Stacy said. She could hear gasps from the audience and looked at the judge for his response. But his facial expression gave nothing away. This is a serious allegation, Stacy. The judge reacted. You said you had proof. Can you show it to me? Stacy walked up to the judge and took something out of her pocket. It was a crumpled up $100 bill. She handed over the money to the judge and said, This is from one of the big bags full of money. The judge took the money and gave it to an officer. He mumbled something Stacy couldn't hear and then turned to face Stacy's foster father directly. Arrest this man, the judge ordered. Stacy's father tried to talk himself out of it. But the judge was certain. It was a bold move without any proven evidence. But he trusted Stacy for some reason. Stacy watched with a big smile on her face. As her foster father was escorted out of the building. What will happen to him, she asked. He will be interrogated. And they will test the money for fingerprints. And scan the serial number to see. Which bank it came from. The judge answered. But if it turns out to be wrong. They will let him go, and I will get into big trouble. Stacy's caseworker suggested. That she could stay with him for the night. Until they figured out what to do next. Stacy didn't mind. She was just happy she would never have to go back. To that family again. The police investigated Stacy's allegations. And it turned out she was right. But that wasn't all. It turned out her foster father was not just any bank robber. He was part of a notorious criminal group. He was brought to justice, and his family was banned from ever fostering again. Stacy was placed with a new family. And she finally found her forever home. In this world, many unexplainable phenomena always occur. Yet these realities are real. And they are often surprising. One of them is the induction between twins. They are always inextricably linked with each other. And some magical phenomena will happen to them.
which makes countless people have great curiosity. About twins that a foreign blogger previously updated an unbelievable story. That happened at Memorial Hospital in Worcester. Massachusetts that IT is understood that there was once a pair of twin girls whose names were Carrie Jackson and Brielle Jackson who were born early at Memorial Hospital 12 weeks before the due date because they were born too early the bodies of the two babies were extremely weak and their weight at birth was less than one kilogram if they were not properly taken care of and provided with the necessary medical treatment. They might not be able to survive for a few days. According to the intensive care regulations in the hospital, the two baby girls were placed in separate incubators and assigned exclusive doctor's care. The reason for this arrangement is not only to take good care of the female baby, but also to avoid the possibility of mutual infection between the babies from the first day of birth, under the treatment of doctors, her elder sister Carrie gradually began to gain weight. It is gratifying that Carrie's physical condition is very stable and she is growing steadily every day. Also let doctors and parents see the light. Unfortunately, the condition of her twin sister, Brill, was not very good. And it even became very poor at one point. Although she was treated by a doctor, she never got better after a period of time. Brill's condition continued to worsen. Not only were the doctors helpless, but the parents were also worried. During that time, Brill was in pain and had a very hard time. She cried every day, and her crying parents also burst into tears, looking at their suffering daughter. The parents gradually fell into despair. And just when Brill's condition became critical, a doctor named Gail decided to try a different method to see if it would work for Brill's body. After consulting the parents of the twins for the first time, the parents also agreed. Because there is no better way now. And they are of course willing to try anything to make their children better. Afterwards, the doctor carried the healthier older sister, Carrie, into the younger sister's incubator, allowing the two sisters to stay in the same place. Unexpectedly, a miracle happened not long after. When Carrie approached Brill, who had been crying loudly, actually began to calm down, and her various indicators were miraculously recovering. And then, an even more shocking scene happened. I saw my sister Carrie's little hand suddenly stretched out and hugged her sister. At this moment, Brill's heart rate stabilized almost immediately and her body temperature returned to normal. If it weren't for the photos and recording equipment, people may not believe all this. Everyone who saw this scene cried. Since then, the two girls have been left together. And despite the limited space, both have begun to develop faster. Especially the younger sister. Brill, who has shown a more obvious improvement. After the incident was exposed. Some netizens once said. The moment of embracing the little sister. Can really be called the hug of salvation. Some time after Briar got better. The girls were discharged home in perfect health. The media coverage then garnered so much attention. That Heidi and Paul, the parents of the famous babies, even had to change their phone numbers in order to get rid of reporters. Since then, the younger sisters have not only always slept in the same crib, but even tried to cuddle up to each other. The parents are happy for their deep affection and healthy bodies, the Jackson sisters, and their brave doctors made history. At the hospital, hospital records show that Gail was the first to put twins together. And the hospital has since done a similar study with some interesting results that AS it turned out. The twins never infected their own siblings. Instead they had only positive influences between them. When the twins were 17 years old, 
The reporter finally found the family again. And found that the girls were all beautiful and smart. And even years later, and even years later, when their father showed reporters the photo of the sisters hugging, there were still tears in his eyes. As if it happened yesterday. And that picture of the sisters embracing. As if hugging everyone. Is a reminder of our need to love each other. Apart from this incident. What we want to say next is one incident from Korea. This is a social practice initiated by someone with a heart. It was a cold winter. When the incident happened. An old man with gray hair came to a seaweed bag restaurant alone at night but after sitting down in the store the old man just stared at the menu above the counter and didn't go up to order food immediately as if he didn't have much money with him sure enough the old man took out a banknote in embarrassment and continued to look at the menu in a daze his eyes full of helplessness after struggling for a while the old man embarrassedly greeted the shopkeeper and asked if he could just order half a serving of kimbap because the money he brought was really not enough to buy a whole serving. The other guests who heard the old man's words looked at the old man in surprise. At this moment, the old man was very nervous. At the same time, his helpless eyes were full of anticipation and he hoped that the shopkeeper would agree to his request. Fortunately, the shopkeeper was not unreasonable, seeing how pitiful the old man was. The shopkeeper also broke the rules of the shop. For the first time, he served half a meal to the guest, and quickly served it to the old man. At this moment, a customer beside the old man noticed the old man's condition, and the old man's phone rang, and it was his son. The son, who is working far away, is asking the old man how he is doing recently. In order not to worry his son, the old man lied to his son on the phone, that he was doing well and that he was eating delicacies from mountains and seas, which were very delicious. The son was also relieved when he heard this, and when he learned that his father was doing well, the son immediately hung up the phone. But as soon as he hung up the phone, the old man couldn't control his emotions anymore. And he covered his face in the store and cried bitterly. Looking very sad, the other guests, who heard the old man's conversation, began to look in the direction of the old man, especially the one sitting next to the old man. After noticing the old man's strange behavior, the customer immediately walked up to the old man and asked, are you okay? Seeing that the old man was still a little bit emotional, the customer turned around and walked to the counter. He didn't know what to say to the store. But then he brought a bowl of hot food for the old man. It turned out that he was buying food for the old man. In addition, there was another guest, who immediately took out his wallet, and ordered a few banknotes into the hands of the old man. Facing the stranger's generosity, the old man was at a loss for a while, and he wanted to reject the stranger's kindness immediately. But the customer always smiled, and said it was okay, and repeatedly persuaded the old man to accept it. What is even more touching is that the customer, who handed over the money also said, that after seeing the situation of the old man, he also suddenly thought of his father, and said with emotion, As a son, I must have done a lot wrong. Although this story is just a social practice, it allows us to discover the beauty of human nature, and be moved by it. I hope that there will be more, and more kind-hearted people like this. And I also hope that everyone can treat their family members kindly so that they can have something to depend on when they get old and live a healthy and safe life. Otter came to say goodbye to his mother. She notices something strange and stops the funeral. Her daughter gave her a life chance to save her life. Once again, she suffered a lot from abused stepfather who wanted her death every time she come to house. 
and in her funeral she was faking her cry. She met a certain man who is well known in the world of cloth imports. So they soon became close at first. It was a relationship that revolved around business. But Julia's sympathy kept Frank awake at night. Who saw her as a prize to conquer the stage of the conquest. And her courtship lasted approximately a year. In which Sam dedicated himself to showering her with attention. Gifts and compliments. Sam wanted to take my business away from me. He would be disappointed in how small it is. He has an emporium that he runs from a very young age. He doesn't need another business to run Edward. Looking at the ledger. He was reviewing grumbling under his breath at least. Make sure you won't put the company at risk. That's all I ask you. It turned out that Edward's suspicions about Sam. Weren't just mistrust a few months later. Julia announced to Sam. Eventually they get engaged when she was pregnant. The hard-working woman was beside herself with happiness. When she went to tell her fiancé the big news. All her illusions came crashing down. I know we haven't talked about this. But the truth is that I'm married, and I can't give you my last name. To another child other than my wife and mine. That would destroy my reputation. Julia felt that all her illusions were shattered married. And you weren't going to tell me anything. You aren't going to get a divorce either no Julia. The truth is that I wasn't planning to ask you to marry me. I just wanted our relationship to continue as it is now. Would you be? Julia could not believe that the pre-daughter. She'd loved so much and with whom she saw herself grow old. Was actually a cynical and shameless being. At truly despicable levels, totally broken. She went to her house in search of comfort. Edward received her with a serious face. But he told her to count on him to support her in everything. I suspected him from the beginning Julia. But it doesn't matter anymore. This child will be yours and it will be mine. Woman felt very sad that she couldn't give her child a father. But little Alan didn't care whenever they asked him. She took risks with new businesses. She became interested again in keeping up with all the trends. In handmade crafts and making sure that she was always ahead of the curve in a new stage. She lost a lot of money. But everything she lost. She recovered and she won twice as much all this. While she was taking care of raising Alan who was barely aware. Of all the responsibility that his mother had one day. Edward noticed that his sister was weakening rapidly. So he didn't hesitate to take her to the hospital to do a pertinent test. After a couple, weeks of tests came up with a diagnosis. Which was completely shocking. Mrs. Arnold, I give you this sad news. But what you have is breast cancer. The disease can attack at any time and until now its cause is unknown. Due to the stage in which the tumor is found. It's possible to treat it with chemotherapy. But you can already imagine the risks and consequences of the treatment. Juliet, don't worry, everything will be fine. I promise you whatever you decide to do things will be fine. Julia took her brother's hand tightly and smiled at him. It was a smile full of fear. But she wanted to show him that his words gave her strength. Edward now I have to make sure that Alan lacks nothing. If I can't be there for him. Will you promise to help me Alan? I need you to listen to me for a moment. The boy found his mother's serious tone strange. Since she was always joking and laughing. He sat at the kitchen table expecting some kind of scolding daughter. I know that what I'm going to tell you can scare you a lot. You always have your uncle and grandmother. I wanted you to be aware of everything. Therefore, that you don't feel like I'm hiding important things. From you and just tell you that I'm proud of you. And that I always love you Alan felt that his world was falling apart. He couldn't conceive of a world. Without his mother during the following months. Julia submitted to all the recommendations of her treating doctor. She looked at all option and alternative treatments. But more and more she felt that her body was failing. 
Julia's mother had also practically moved into the hospital. So the room was always full of activity and joy. No one commented on Julia's increasing weakness. Or that the treatments didn't seem to be working working. They all took turns Alan clung with all of his faith. That somehow his mother would recover. But after just five months, Julia gave her last breath. It was a very quiet death early in the morning. Surrounded by her loved ones. Watching one of her favorite movies. She managed to kiss her daughter and tell him how much she loved him. And then she fell asleep and never woke. Up again, only Alan was desperate when he saw the beep. That announced that his mother no longer had a pulse. The nurses and the doctors on duty arrived to disconnect Julia. From the piles of cables and declare the time of death. Alan went out with his grandmother to cry in one of the hospital corridors. They had not spent 30 minutes when an elegant man approached them. Ignoring the deep pain of the scene. Alan, I don't know how you'll take it. But I'm your father, my name. Is Sam Allen froze up hearing the man's confession. But his grandmother immediately began to insult him. Suddenly everything became violent and confusing for the boy. His grandmother kept insulting the man. Who had confessed to being his father. The man left after he reached the safety of the hospital. But before he told them. I'm here to look for Alan He's My daughter, and you can't stop me from meeting him. The boy didn't know what to do. With it all the information he thought. Maybe it was a lie told by a deranged man. But as for his grandmother. She told his uncle Edward was very upset and made Alan promise. Never to speak to that man again from that moment. Things started to happen very fast. Sam went to Julia's house the next day. Accompanied by police officers and lawyers. Edward tried to stop him from talking to the boy. But to no avail. Because he'd gotten a judge's order. Alan felt uncomfortable. But he felt that he had no choice but to talk. To the man for at least a few minutes. Alan. I'm very sorry about your mother's death and how we met. But I couldn't wait to see you to see you while your mom was alive. She didn't. Let me meet you or be in your life. I don't know what they told you about me. But I assure you that it's not what you think. I just want to be there for you. For whatever need Alan looked at his uncle. Looking for what to say. John returned a supportive look. Well, the truth is that we didn't talk about you. My mom told me that you couldn't get to know me or take care of me. And the truth is that I didn't care because I always had my uncle. The truth is, I didn't need you. The elegant merchant was speechless at the boy's response. But immediately recovered his spirits and said well. What your mother told you is not entirely true. I'd like to tell you everything that happened. But we'll have time. The truth is that I've also come to claim you as my daughter. I want you to come with me and meet your brothers. So we'll have the chance to get to know each other better. But Alan remained silent. Not knowing what to say the house. The house was filled with shouts and threats. Until the police decided that the visit had lasted too long. And they should leave once they left. Alan took Edward's hand and a broken voice told him uncle. I don't want to go with that man. I'm scared. I don't want to leave my house Edward hugged. His nephew promising him that he would never. Let that man take him anywhere. The next day was Julia's funeral. No less than 200 people came to the venue. Many of them were people whom Julia. Had helped in some way Alan felt lost. Hugging his grandmother. He saw per daughter after per daughter. Say goodbye to his mother at every moment. He wanted to get into that urn and accompany. His mother to wherever she was around nine. In the morning he heard a racket at the door of the chapel. They had rented as he got closer. He could see that it was his uncle and his father who were arguing again. He moved closer to listen. Better Frank, be readotterable. He's barely a child, a child he's just lost his mother. If you take him now. 
it'll be terrible for him at least try to gain his trust. No, I will not wait any longer. I've waited eleven years. You've planted tears against me in his mind. I'm taking him away today. The law is on my side. Listening to the discussion. Fear and pain made Alan lose his nerve. And ran to his mother's coffin, where they prepared to say their last words. Before taking her to the cemetery. He hugged the coffin amid screams and sobs. Declaring that he wasn't going anywhere. I'm not going to go with anyone. I just want to go with my mom in the midst of the scandal. And the struggle of the attendees tried to remove. The child from the coffin and thus continue to the cemetery. Alan saw something protruding. From the interior decorations of the coffin. He noted that there were white sheets. And he could read the words testament. And Alan immediately started screaming again. There's something in the casket there's something. In the casket there's something in the casket. Something is in there. It says my name and it says we'll open it. Those who were fighting to remove Alan. From the coffin came closer to see what the boy was talking about. All those who approached managed to see the papers. That Alan was talking about Edward saw them too. He knew there was something strange. He immediately ordered the wake to stop. So he could open the coffin. When they finally managed to remove the sheets. They realized that they were all signed. Copies of Julia's will. Where they were available. That the only heir to the company was Alan. And the caretaker of the inheritance until he turned 18 would be Edward. It turned out that Sam upon learning that Julia was about to die. Decided to keep her company by adopting Alan. He bribed one of Edward's assistants. To mix up the papers and put Julia's legal will inside her coffin. Leaving a false will where he would be responsible. For the company until Alan turned 18 years old. Finding himself discovered Sam disappeared once again. Leaving no trace. Alan was left in the care of his uncle and his grandmother. He grew up knowing that nothing could replace the spirit.